are, of course, in the book of Philippians. And uh, today, I'm going to cover part two of the message that I started last week from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Uh, this is really the heart of what we are called to understand, called to do, the heart of Christianity. And so I wanted to remind you that there are two things threatening uh, the health of the Philippian church. And that's why Paul is writing. He's writing one, I mean, there's one side of him where he wants them to rejoice and to understand what it means to have real joy in all circumstances. But then there's these other issues that are really going on. Uh, the first issue was the danger which threatened them because of false teachers, right? He deals with that in chapter 3. There are always false teachers trying to creep into the churches, trying to sow their seeds of doubt. I mean, you have to remember that Peter put it like this. The devil is like a, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, right? He's on the search, and he's looking for those openings, for those windows where you drop your guard where you're not sound in doctrine, so that he can lead you astray. Paul even wrote to Timothy uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and he said, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Through the insincerity of what? Liars. So they have heard the truth. They might know the truth, but they're lying about it. Whose conscience are seared. And all you got to watch is the television today. And you'll see that everywhere. And then he wrote towards the end of his life again to Timothy. But understand this. That in the last days there will come times of difficulty. And man, if this doesn't mark our generation. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins, and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Man, that, that is our world that we live in. It, it's constant. We are being bombarded by false doctrine, false teachers, heresy. It's everywhere. Well, the second reality that was threatening uh, the health of this church was that of disunity. It's a big deal. We are called to be one just as Jesus and the Father are one. And there's a sense in which this danger is almost more prevalent in a, in a healthy church where beliefs really matter. Because when beliefs really matter, right, people are more apt to come into conflict because they're like, no, well, this is what I believe and this is the truth. And you got somebody over here like, no, 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 this is the, and then you're splitting hairs. You're, you're fighting over things that don't need to be fought over. The greater their enthusiasm, the greater the danger that they may collide because they really want to hold on to the truth. And, and so there's a danger of disunity, and I, I believe that it's against this danger that Paul's trying to safeguard his brothers and sisters because there's conflict he doesn't address what the conflict is over, but because these are people of truth, these are people that he loved, he, and he doesn't call out the doctrine. He doesn't like say, well, hey, you know, because when there's something that's really going on that shouldn't be going on, like with the Galatian church and other churches, he will call it out. So let's look again at our text, Philippians 1 
and 2 says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. And then the crux of what he's saying in this text is do nothing, verse 3, from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Now, remember last week I said this was one long sentence in the Greek. It's verses 1 through 4, one long sentence. A continuation from the exhortation that Paul gave or started in verse 27 of chapter 1. The entire section from 127 all the way to 211 are the kind of the commands, the, the desires, the call that Paul is giving to this church. He's like, this is what you are to do, which includes the famous kenosis theory that we'll talk about or the self-emptying passage that we'll see next Sunday uh, from verses 5 through 11 in which the Son of God himself is set forth as the one who we are to follow, the perfect example in every way, beginning with the way that we think, our attitudes. But we're going to start here by looking again at the call to unity because this is the issue. There's arguing going on in the church, separation, disunity, and so Paul is calling them to be unified. He wants them to be of the same mind, of the same heart, of the same passions. So he says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my, this will complete my joy. This will fill me with joy that overflows. Complete my joy. How? By being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. Now, like I said, this is a, an exhortation all the way back from verse 27. Well, verse 27, Paul said, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live up to what God has done. Let your life be worthy. Man, that's, that's a tough call. I mean, how could we ever really be worthy? But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. It doesn't mean we shouldn't give all that we have to be worthy of that call. I mean, how could we ever be worthy of the gospel, worthy of what Jesus did for us? He says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Do you see the call to unity? It starts here in verse 27 and carries over into chapter 2. Paul was talking about living in a manner worthy of this gospel so that they might be unified as one body. He followed that message with a call to show unity in specific ways. We see that in verse 3 and 4. He gives us four qualities in verse 1. Last week I talked about the if then, right? If this is true, if this is a reality, then this is how we should respond. The if, then, you know, they're first class conditions in the Greek. So that means they're important and they are to be followed. And they're certainties, realities that Paul understands and writes about. They're not questionable things. These are facts. These are truths. So Paul appeals on the basis of these realities to move them to unity, to strive for this unity that Jesus prayed for in John 17. So there are four 
Talked about them last week. Just want to review them real quick. So if there's, number one, any encouragement in Christ because of what Christ has done, any comfort from love. Number three, any participation in the Spirit, right? We are all united by the Holy Spirit who bonds us together. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Any affection and sympathy. Because of what he has done, this is how we respond. So on the basis of what was presented in verse 1, Paul exhorts his readers to show in practical ways how to be unified. In practical ways, how to walk together, how to live this way. He corresponds with four realities because of the four qualities in verse 1. He gives four specific ways in which their spiritual unity should be realized, should be seen. That they would be first like-minded, same mind, have the same love, his love flowing in us and through us, the same spirit, one in spirit, being in full accord, that's what it means, and be of one purpose, that's the one mind, one direction, one goal. This is how we are called to live, one purpose, one mind. And, and this is so difficult because we are Americans, right? We're individualists. We've been taught to think for ourselves. Look, I want you to think for yourself. But even in thinking for yourself, we still need to be pushing towards one goal, one purpose, one hope, one Lord, one Savior. How does that happen? How can it ever happen when you have a diverse group of people, all of us, right? We're all different. We got different backgrounds. We got different nationalities. We got different heritages. We've got different family members. We're different in gender. We're different in our thinking. How do we all become one? How is that possible? It's not in our own strength. It takes humility. The only way any of us can work towards a common goal, having a common Lord and a common purpose, is to humble ourselves. And so Paul, and the part that we're focusing on today, gives us a call towards humility, a call for us to live in humility. So he moves from the four qualities, the realities, to the four ways to how? Well, here's how he lays it out. Do nothing from selfish ambition. That's number one. Or conceit. Number two. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest. Number three, but also to the interest of others. So right here in verse three and four, he gives us three great causes of disunity. Three, three ways. Selfish ambition causes division. Conceit, pride causes division. Looking to your own interest can cause division. Division. He starts with selfish ambition. There is always the danger, and this is true, that people might work not to advance the kingdom of God or the work of God, but to advance themselves. Like, look at me. Look at what I did. Somebody pat me on the back. Somebody give me an attaboy. There's... The desire for personal prestige to be seen, prestige for many people, is even a greater temptation than wealth. To be admired and respected, to have a seat on the platform, to have your opinion sought after, to be known by name, even to be flattered. Are for many people 
their most desirable thing. Like just somebody, see me, want me, know me. But the aim of a true Christ follower ought to be not self-display, but self-obliteration. I am crucified with Christ. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, I live by what? Faith. Man, it's not about us. We should do good deeds. Jesus said in Matthew 5, let your light shine that men might see your good deeds and glorify your Father which art in heaven, right? We should do good deeds, but not in order that others would glorify us, but that they might glorify our Father in heaven. We should desire to focus on giving our lives away, but not so people say, wow, man, you are so awesome. Wow, you are so surrendered. Wow, you are such a great Christ follower. You're such a great example to the world. And that's, that's, not, that's not it. And there's this lurking inside all of us that pushes us that way. Nothing is to be done out of selfish ambition or self-promotion. And then he adds, or conceit, which the NIV translates it better in this passage. It says, vain conceit, or it could be empty glory, or self-esteem. I mean, our world's all about self-esteem, right? You need a healthy self-esteem. Really? You want to be all that in a bag of chips? How's that been working for you, right? That doesn't do us any good because it's never about us. It's always about him, and we forget that, and we start building ourselves up. Look at me. Look at me. I'm the man, and it's really never about us, and I believe that's why he adds conceit because it's pride, and pride is at the core of all selfish ambition. It's at the core of building yourself up, often at the expense of tearing others down. Right? You'll be like, you know, putting others down so that you look better. Or you'll even think that you're better. And you wouldn't do that intentionally. You wouldn't be like, yeah, I'm better than so-and-so. But you'll look at all their faults. So that subconsciously, they're below you. You're like, oh, man, that guy's such a loser. He's always complaining or he's always negative or he's always critical. And in your mind, you're saying that to yourself and you're feeling better about yourself because you're like, yeah, I don't do that. I would never do that. I would never act that way. And it's really a, an attempt to lift yourself up. But that's not God's way. God's not about lifting yourself up. God's about lifting others up. So he gives two negatives, self-esteem, conceit, followed by a positive exhortation. In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Well, of course, with the conjunction, but, right? So he adds the but in there. But, to contrast the words of lifting yourself up and walking in humility. One is about look at me. The other one is it's not about me. Humility before God. Isn't that hard? Because you're like, yeah, God's everything. But humility before others. And that's where we really struggle. We would all agree that God is great. Anybody in here? We're all takers, right? God's awesome. God is wonderful. God is holy. God is sovereign. God is everything. But humbling yourself before God means also humbling yourself before others. 
And this is the niche. This is where we get stuck. Because it's easy to acknowledge that God is awesome, that God is great, that God is perfect. But it's the spirit of pride, this ego. We all struggle with our ego. You ever get your feelings hurt? Of course you do. Why? Because you have an ego. That's why you get your feelings hurt. Because you expected something, and what you got was this. And the gap between what you thought you would get or what you thought you deserved and what you really got is the level of hurt that you experience. Paul exhorted the Philippians to consider others before themselves. So what is humility? When we talk about humility, what is humility and how do we live in humility? So some people have this idea that humility, being humble, means beating yourself up, right? Like, I'm a loser, I'm no good, I'm stupid, but that's just really false pride. It's a superficial pride. You're really just wanting everybody to say, no, man, you're not a loser, you're wonderful, you know, so, so you, you, it's a form of manipulation to have other people build you up. You're like, oh, man, I'm such an idiot. Now, there are people who believe they are an idiot, and rightfully so, right? <laughs> like, I'm such a, yep. You just can agree and nod and be like, okay, yeah, you are. Because the reality is we all are, right? You're a loser. Yep, we all are. We're all losers. We're all idiots. Why? Because we're not perfect. We're all ignorant. It's just the way it is. So when the Bible talks about humility, it's not about beating yourself up. It's not about the superficial, oh, I'm horrible. I never do anything right. That, that's really bad to think that way. So when I think about humility, for, for me, when I think about humility, humility means getting out of the way. It's about taking the focus completely off yourself. It's not about me at all anymore. That's humility. It's focusing on those around you and forgetting about self. It's removing self so that you can give your life away. I love the way Peter wrote it. In the last chapter of 1 Peter, he says in chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, he says, likewise, like in the same way, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. The elders doesn't mean the old people. It means the leaders in the church. You who are younger. Why? Because when you're young, you think you know everything. <laughs> I don't know why. My 15-year-old grandson even wants to go to school because he already knows everything. Why does he need to go to school, right? He's already got it all figured out. I told him the other day, man, you should just drop out. I don't understand why you're going to school because obviously you already know everything, so nobody can tell you anything, so you should just drop out and go right into college, get your GED and start now. You know, Or go into the military. They'll pay for your college. It's free that way. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourself. So think about clothing yourself, right? In order to put on clothes, you got to take off. So this clothing yourself has the idea of removing something in order to put something on. What do you got to remove? Pride. Clothe yourself. And then he clarifies, not just the younger people, all of you. Because this is a Universal problem. It's not like, oh man, you got a lot of pride. Oh man, you got a lot of pride. No, we all have a lot of pride. We all struggle with our ego. All of you, with humility, there it is, with humility toward one another. So the real deal is to be lifting up one another, to be focused on one another, with humility toward one another. 
For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to who? The humble. The ones who take the focus off themselves. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time. Who decides when it's the proper time? God does. That's not up to you. But when you're trying to take care of your ego, you're trying to be in control, you're trying to make it happen, you're trying to get it done, it's all you. It's me, me, me. And then it's never the proper time because it's always too late or it came too early because you want it when you want it. But that's pride. But at the proper time, he may exalt you. Who's the one exalting you? God, not you. It's not because you did such a great job. It's not because you figured it all out. It's not because you're that intelligent. It's because God comes through, because God is faithful, because God is sovereign, because God is merciful, because God is compassionate. So because God is compassionate and merciful and loving and kind and gracious and holy and sovereign over all things, he will work it out in his perfect timing, which is the proper time for you and for everyone you know. But it's our job to be humble towards one another, not trying to make it happen. This is the attitude that Christ displayed. That's why verse 5 says, let this attitude or mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. So he's talking about this perspective in the first four verses, and then we'll see he transitions, verse 5, into what Christ really did, who Christ really was, and how he set that. And that beautiful example for each and every one of us to follow, to walk in. This is how we create unity. By removing self. As long as self is involved, there is no unity. Because if your ego is in there, it's all about you. It's always going to be about you. And there can't be unity when everybody's fighting for themselves. When everybody's pulling for themselves, you need to be pulling for your brothers and sisters. You need to be seeking for their good. Let God take care of your good. You work for their good. And I said, no, you can't do that, Scott. That's not the American way. It's not smart. That's stupid. Yeah, you can think that. But that's not what God's word says. It's not what he's teaching. Paul explains how Humility can be expressed. So instead of concentrating on self, he says each believer should be concerned for the interest of others. Right? He, he says, and this is really easy to see, let each of you, verse 4, Look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. So this is explaining how humility works. Because you don't got to think about looking to your own. It's natural for you. It's natural for you to look to your own interest. But it's unnatural to start looking to the interest of others. So that's where we really need to work is how do we do that? Because preoccupation with self is nothing short of sinful. When you're preoccupied with yourself, it is pride. And it is pride that got Satan kicked out of heaven. I love what Paul said to the Roman church, or the church at Rome, when he says in verse 9, love must be sincere without hypocrisy. Right? That, that's verse 9. Let it be genuine. And then he adds in verse 10, love one another. Have God's love, real love, real love that's genuine, sincere. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. What does honor mean? To lift them up. See, true humility is to humble yourself 
so that you might lift others up. Man, are we doing that? we seeking to build others up? I mean, that's what it means to look to the interest of others. So I generally don't want to give you three things in a poem, but today I am. But I'm going to give you four things and cut the poem. All right? So we're going to do away with the poem because I want you to really understand, and I hope that you'll write these down. Just basic, just some practical application in how to look to the interest of others. Simple things, I promise. It doesn't take a rocket science this, to figure this out. Simple things. Number one, pray for others. Set aside some time to pray for others in the morning and in the night. Not to Concerned about how much time, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever. Set some time in the morning before you, you start your day and before you go to sleep. Kind of like bookends, right? Beginning and end. Pray for others. This is one way you can look to the interest of others. Because I was thinking, how do we do this? How do we practically apply this? Number two, look for ways to encourage others. Start thinking. Ask yourself, how can I encourage Tim? How can I encourage Sean? How can I encourage Adam? How can I be encouraging to my brothers or my sisters? What can I do that will encourage them? And then write it down. Think about ways so that you can carry it out. Like how can I be encouraging? How, how can I really build up, because that's what it means to encourage, to build up my brother or my sister in Christ? Number three. Find ways to serve others. Man, you got a neighbor that you really want to encourage and you realize their grass is getting high because they're overwhelmed, they're busy, they're tired. Man, take your little lawnmower, drive over to their house. You don't got to say anything, just go cut their grass. Man, they'll come home, smile on their face. I know I would. You show up at my house any day. I don't have any grass anymore, so you don't got to worry about it. But, but nobody would come over and cut it, so nobody wanted to come cut my grass. But look for ways that you might encourage others. Man, it takes the focus. It'll help you. If you start thinking daily about how to encourage the people in your life, because they're there by design. Like, nobody's in your life by accident. Nobody. If God is truly sovereign, and according to Psalms 139, every day was ordained for you before you were even here, right? Every day was written in my book before one of them came to be. So all the people that are in your life are here by design. God has them in your life for a reason. So think of ways that you might be able to serve them last. Look for their, their needs, real needs, and figure a way to meet that need. Like you realize they've got a need. They can't get to the grocery store. Their car's broke now. Go pick up some groceries. Drop them off. Whatever the real need is. One, you're praying about them. Two, you're seeking to encourage. Three, you're serving. Four, it just builds on each other. Find out what they have. Now, the only way you're going to know what somebody's needs are is if you get to know them. Now, you already have people in your life that you already really know. But there are other people that God has placed in your life that you really don't know. And the only way you're going to know what their real needs are is to get to know them. So that means coming out of your shell, taking the time to interact, to connect, to love. Man, this is looking to the interest of others. This is what it means to be a Christ follower. Look, it's easy to be all about ourselves. It's natural. But we need to live supernaturally. Amen? We need to live supernaturally because we have a supernatural God who has filled us with his spirit that we might live for him in this life. And we might glorify him and honor him. And the world might see him by the way we live. So, 
You can't do that by thinking of just yourself. So you got to come out of your shell. You got to do some things that are uncomfortable. I mean, Jesus is our perfect example. Do you think it was comfortable for him to go to the cross? Do you think it was comfortable for him to be humiliated, arrested, beat, whipped, mocked? He came out of his comfort zone. Man, it would be a lot more comfortable to stay in heaven. No pain, no sorrow, no people. Because sometimes people can be uncomfortable. But he did that for our interest, not his. Jesus died for your best interest. What are you doing for the interest of others? So I just want you to be thinking about this. And working ways that you might be able to serve others by putting their interests before yourself. Why? Because God says so. That's why. It's simple. God says to do this. That's why we do it. We don't do it because it's going to make us feel better or look better or get a pat on the back or get an attaboy. We do this because God said to do it. And that's why we do it. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you that your word is clear and perfect. Help us, Lord, not to live for selfish ambition or conceit, to do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, God, help us to put others above ourselves, to humble ourselves, by taking the focus off of our lives, Father, to think about your glory and the people's needs around us. And I pray, God, that you would help us because we can only do this through your grace, through your spirit, through your power. It's so easy to get wrapped up in what we've got going on, our plans, our hopes, our dreams. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for being self-centered. Forgive us for being selfish. Lord, help us to be selfless. Help us to be more like Jesus, willingly laying down our lives for the good of those around us, for the good of the people that you've brought into our lives, for your glory, God, for your honor. Be glorified, God in our lives and thank you for your word that speaks truth to us now help us to apply it Lord in Jesus name Amen